morning, sports fans. Uh, it's November 17th, and we're the Courier Paper Boys. I'm Doug Newhoff, and I'm joined today uh, by Jim Sullivan at my left, uh, Nick Materos to my right, and Jim Nelson at my far right. Um, we've got all kinds of things to talk about today, so let's get right into it. Uh, probably the most uh, immediate thing is college basketball. Um, Sully, you just uh, got back from the McLeod Center. Um, you and I uh, got even at one and one on the season with a uh, what looked like a pretty impressive win over Stephen F. Austin. Um, my take, uh, I guess, uh, at a casual glance, is that it was a, just a good matchup for you and I. They were able to play their, their four-guard lineup pretty effectively, uh, which maybe wasn't the case against Colorado State uh, last weekend when they lost their, uh, their opener. Yeah, Colorado State, I think, was a much more uh, physical and, and quicker, quick team than Stephen F. Austin was. That said, Stephen F. Austin had four starters back from NCAA tournament team, uh, had, uh, had the... Um, had some guys who could shoot, so it wasn't a uh, kid named Waka specific was the one who carried the offense. And uh, but I thought that, that for all of that, you and I looked better uh, defensively. They seemed much more pleased with what they did, much more comfortable with what they did. Offensively, it looked like some guys felt a little bit more uh, at ease, especially Paul Jesperson early. I don't think all the rust had been shaken off uh, the last Saturday against Colorado State. He looked much much more effective, much more confident, uh, moved better, had a couple pull up shots, hit a three, went to the basket well. And then uh, things got a little hairy in the second half when uh, SFA got down to down to eight, and that's when West, West Washburn took over, started going, uh, had a good matchup, started taking the ball a hole and scored with regularity, and you and I was able to come out with the victory. So they are one and one. Uh, ben Jacobson thought they made some steps forward. He thought he saw something closer to the team he wants to see and expects to see, and I guess we'll find out if they made enough strides uh, this weekend when they take on the Tar Heels. <laughs> Indeed, number one North Carolina coming in. Uh, They've got a big guy in the middle, uh, Kennedy Meeks, um, who is just an absolute load. One of the most talented players in the country, no doubt a future NBA type guy, probably a lottery type pick in the draft. Um, I'm kind of surprised he came back this season, actually, but um, he's going to be a handful. Yes, um, I'm not sure. They've, the first two games probably didn't offer anything quite close to that. I mean, no. it, it a guy with that dimensions, and they may not see their test quite close to that until unless they get to postseason play. But certainly we'll find out a lot more about what, um, well, what Bennett Cook and Ted Freeman are made of. Uh, Bennett Cook had some good moments today. It's a moments where he struggled a little bit. So their pivot play is still, I don't think they'll ever get to the point where it was with Seth Tuttle. Didn't and look I, like they played their bigs as much today. I mean, Cook, 20 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Ted Friedman, only about 10, 10 minutes. Yeah. So uh, more of the four-guard type of uh, attack today. Right, and uh, with Jesperson, I'm not sure if playing center is quite the right term, but he was the right. inside guy. Um, for all I know, they may decide to uh, to try that against Carolina, figuring, well, we can't, you know, match up one on one with me, so let's try something a little bit different. Maybe pressure the the backward, pressure the guards, and maybe, you know, double team Meeks since I was some quicker guys who can take the ball to his hands. So that might be an approach. I would guess we're going to try at least early on to use Cook and or Freeman and, and see what happens there, and if, if things go south, then go to Plan B. One, one thing I'm confident in is that Coach Jacobson will have a plan that if you can beat North Carolina, um, he'll have a plan that will allow you to do it. Now, whether they have the, the people to do it and they execute it, the plan well enough to do it uh, is a whole other story. But uh, he'll have them in position to, to give them the best possible opportunity to shut down uh, North Carolina and find a way to be competitive in that game. Yeah, well, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, you got a lot of the Cedar Rapids, Iowa City kids that will be going up against Marcus Page again. I imagine that will be a, kind of a neat opportunity for them as well. It would have been. Unfortunately, uh, Marcus Page broke his hand oh, yeah, right. a while back. Now, mm -hmm. there have been some rumblings out of, out of North Carolina he may try to play. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I checked this morning. I haven't seen anything new on that. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that, that he'll be that available, that the hand will have healed that much to make him ready to go. But if there's any way he can get on the court, I'm sure he will because his family will be there. He's played against a lot of these guys, Low House, Washburn, and so on. So that was the whole reason we have this, yeah. this game on the Saturday. So Marcus Page can come home and play. So if, if it can happen, it will. But I would be surprised if, if it did. Mm -hmm. It'll be a fun game. Uh, you know, it'll be a great atmosphere Saturday. Or, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, looking elsewhere around the state, I mean, we're only two games into the season, but. Uh, you know, it looks like we're going to have some great college basketball to watch uh, in addition to you and I. Um, Iowa's beaten up on Gardner-Webb and Coppin State uh, in its first two games. Uh, that doesn't tell me a whole lot about what kind of um, character or uh, leadership the Hawkeyes really have. Uh, they need to be tested before we're really going to know that. But 
Uh, they've added some new parts that are that are performing quite well to date, and uh, they have a challenging week coming up with a game at Marquette, and then they head to uh, a tournament in Florida where they'll also have to play some good teams. So we'll learn a lot more about them uh, here shortly. What do you guys see with the Hawkeyes so far? Well, it's kind of neat, isn't uh, Dale Jones getting some some rep off the the, the bench, the Waterloo kid? Uh, it looked nice. like he could be a, a nice addition. So that's kind of a neat story to follow, just to see a guy that that's kind of took the long path into. Division One basketball and, and being a trick contributor with this team on nearby. Would have liked to have seen him in a Panther uniform. I think he would have been a great addition to UNI's program and really done well in the Missouri Valley. But um, he knows where he wants to be and what he wants to do, and he'll probably do pretty well for the Hawkeyes too. Mm -hmm. I think he had a good last game. I think he had 15. Yeah, yeah. He did. Shoots the ball well. He's for a big guy, especially you know, perimeter game is pretty good. So. Iowa State's 2-0. I mean, they beat Colorado State, and uh, then they uh, put a pretty good one on Chicago State uh, last night, I guess it was. Um, they were tested by Colorado, which was good for them. Uh, not so much with Chicago State. Um, that was pretty much a mismatch. Um, Jamil McKay went crazy and uh, dunked him right out of the building, basically. Um, my first impression of the Cyclones, for what little uh, highlights I've seen and so forth, is that uh, Steve Prohm, their new coach, is pretty much letting the Cyclones be the Cyclones. That was uh, the game plan, I think, from the get-go. Uh, he made it pretty clear at their media day that he wasn't going to try to steer them a lot offensively. He felt they knew what they had to do and could do it with such a veteran team, with a, with a great All-American, potentially, a uh, point guard in uh, oh, uh, Monte Morris. Morris. And you got George Niang back. You've got all these guys back, so just let them play. We'll worry about the defensive end. And... Uh, it worked, uh, to, at least to some extent, against Colorado. Uh, they did have some issues, but I think just that first game thing on a foreign court played into that. Uh, as you suggested, Chicago State did not offer much of a test, so not a sustained one for 40 minutes. So uh, Iowa State's out of the gate well. Everyone's healthy. Uh, they seem to be playing reasonably well. And, and as we all know, things are getting a little bit tougher uh, and not that far down the road. I think the most impressive takeaway from the Colorado game was as a game where they weren't hitting their shots and they still found a way to do enough defensively to, to pull out a win that maybe you couldn't say that about them in some of those games last year, but their their toughness on the defensive side, being able to carry them through an early game uh, has to be a promising side, a sign as well for this team. Yeah, it should, it's going to be a fun year. Fun year. With you and I, Iowa, Iowa State, you know, uh, all three are going to be exciting teams to watch. You know. One question that, that I have with Iowa State is um, – how good their depth is. Um, I'm not sure that if they get into some foul trouble or, or they get dinged up a little bit, whether they've got the people uh, further down the roster to step in and fill those holes and continue to play at that high level. So these non-conference games um, in these tournaments and so forth against some good competition are going to be really important to the, uh, the development of that team as we go forward. Uh, let's move over to college football. Um, Start with the Hawkeyes, I guess. They're the sixth ranked team in the country. They're 10 and 0. Um, things are going well. Um, looks like one of those Hawkeye teams that just keeps finding a way to win. Um, we've seen them before and uh, they're fun to watch. And um, this week they've got a 2 and 8 Purdue team uh, at Kinnick Stadium. Um, Boilermakers haven't won much, but uh, they have kind of risen to the occasion in a couple of their biggest games. They played uh, Michigan State to a three-point game in East Lansing and uh, beat Nebraska, I believe it was like 55 to 45 or something like that. So um, do we have anything to worry about this week or uh, do the Hawkeyes take care of business? I think they take care of business uh, at home. <clears throat> they, they, got, they know what's ahead of them. I don't think they'll, uh, they'll, they'll lose, at least they won't lose enough focus to lose the game. I think if that, if that makes any sense. Uh, Purdue will be on the road. Uh, I just don't see it happening. Although, as you suggested, they somehow beat Nebraska in a game that was, that was mind-boggling. They got out, scored 40-some points. Uh, I don't think anyone in the world saw that coming. Uh, the Minnesota game was somewhat interesting, if only because I thought Minnesota's only chance to win was to keep the game like 17-14, 20-17. They put 35 points on the board. What does Iowa do? Scores 40. Um, I think that speaks to uh, the sum of the balance they have. Bethard played well. Um, you know, we keep saying that, uh, or people, critics keep saying they haven't played anybody yet. You know, they haven't played Ohio State, Michigan, but they just keep answering the bell. And they put themselves in excellent position now, assuming they get past these next two, to make a serious run at whoever comes out on the other side, be it uh, Michigan State or Ohio State, for uh, a right to move on to the semifinals, perhaps. It's one of those deals, yeah, they just don't know how to lose, so they don't know any better. Even if they would were to go up against a, a better team, you, you, you think they're going to have that confidence now. And... Uh, 
Uh, I think against Purdue, it's one of those games where you almost want to, if you're an Iowa fan, you almost want to see them come out and, and, and just dominate from start to finish. They haven't really blown out some of these teams that, that they maybe could have earlier in the season, like your Illinois or, or Minnesota's. They've kind of let them hang around there a little bit. So uh, last home game at Kinnick Stadium, you have to think they'll be, uh, they'll be ready to, to put up a pretty impressive showing there. You know, they're, not, they're not built to blow people out, though. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, just no. not the, that's not the way they play. Two things I took away. I was able to pick up the game on WHO out of Springfield, so it was kind of <laughs> But I, I picked it up. I was really impressed. You know, two 90-yard drives in one game, that's impressive against yeah. anybody, including one, what was it, 17 plays? I mean, that took up, like, the whole, what was it, the first quarter <laughs> or second quarter? That was a big one. That was a big one. But I tell you what, Colin Calvert was getting <clears throat> zero ratings on his FS1, but now that he says Iowa sucks, boy, he's, his ratings went through, ended through the roof, <laughs> especially uh, the two million Iowans that are hating him right now. Yeah, he should be on the unemployment line. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just a, a general level, I mean, I'm so tired of the argument that Iowa hasn't played anybody. Um, the good football is good football, and it doesn't matter um, – Exactly. Who it's against them, yeah. and these Big Ten teams aren't rolling over and just saying we're going to go to Iowa and lose. I mean, they're giving the Hawkeyes everything they've got. They've been competitive. I mean, if you look at the Illinois and the Indianas and the Purdue's, they've been competitive competitive with the best teams in the Big Ten. So the, there isn't that big a difference between the teams that win and the teams that don't. And good football is good football, and you don't get to ten and zero without playing good football. So that's my, well, that's all I got to say about that. Exactly. You know? My advice to Iowa fans would, would be to just, if uh, you're all tempted to listen to Colin Howard, don't. I mean, you're, you'll find something else. You're only playing into his hands. I mean, the, he knows how to bait. He knows how to, to push his ratings along. And one way to do that is to is to troll a given audience, and, and people have responded to that. Um, the argument, I think you're right, the argument they haven't played anybody is a little bit old and tired. But pe perception sometimes is greater than reality. And the fact of the matter is, they did not play Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, neither did Wisconsin for that matter. That's not Iowa's fault. But they put themselves in a position now where I think it'll be a game, no matter which one of those three shows up on the other side. And if you know if it's a game, they're gonna have a chance to win. That's all you can ask for. And I think that's the, the message that people should listen to going forward. How interesting would a Michigan Iowa Big Ten title game be with uh, that quarterback battle? It would be yeah. a little bit of fun. That would be fun, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Iowa State. Um, you know, they just can't seem to catch a, a big break um, when they need it. Um, they played so hard Saturday night, and they had Oklahoma State on the ropes, but the Cowboys kind of did a holly home on the on the Cyclones in the fourth quarter and uh, delivered the old knockout blow. Um, Saturday, it's down to Kansas State. Um, the Wildcats aren't having one of their greatest seasons, um, but uh, it's always a tough place to play, and uh, uh, Iowa State... Uh, they need a win. I mean, let's, yeah. I uh, think they uh, deserve a win. It was interesting watching Rhodes in that press conference after the game. I think he said all the right things, but but he, he just kind of looked, uh, you know, a little defeated there. And, and who's to blame him? He had a good opportunity to get a win, and it was one of those deals where, you know, Oklahoma State, I think, converted 11 of their first 15 third down opportunities, and it was third and longs that they were converting on pass plays. Uh, Iowa State just couldn't find a way to get, get, off, get its defense off the field when they needed to in that game, and uh, you know, it's really tough. Uh, you, you've got three years in a row that that program hasn't gone to a bowl game now. Um, it'll be really tough with two uh, road games coming up to, to keep that team energized and, and looking to the future. But I, I like a lot of those young pieces they have. I think Lanning um, it continues to progress well at the quarterback position. He shows what he can do with his feet. Uh, you've got Mike Warren, uh, you know, your wide receivers with Bundridge and Lazard. Uh, you, I think you have some nice pieces to build around for the future. I like how hard they play for yeah. Coach Rhodes too, and I, you know, you, there may be the critics out there who think it's time to make a coaching change. I totally disagree. Um, I think when you get a team that's in the position Iowa State's in, that continues to play as hard as they do, and uh, play quality opponents as closely as they have, um, your head coach is not your problem. It's interesting. Rob Gray, who's a longtime sports writer in the state, once for the Morning Venture, now we're, <coughs> excuse me, works for one of the uh, uh, fanzines down there, pointed out that. Let's say for the sake of the discussion, you do decide to go another direction and let roads go. There are so many other jobs now available in college football, plum jobs, high paying jobs, prestige jobs. Who's going to pass or go to Iowa State as opposed to some of these other jobs? Or more to the point, you're going to listen to the other ones first before you go to Iowa State. And I think the point is well taken that they have some young talent. I mean, Lazard looks like he's going to be a possible NFL receiver. Warren is the best freshman running back they've ever had by by. Statistically speaking, Lanning has made strides. They've got young guys in the defensive line. 
uh, I think the road said Monday, eight of their uh, 11 are underclassmen starting on the, on the defense. So they've got some pieces, and now all they have to do is maybe find a couple more. And does that mean they're going to be right there with Oklahoma, Oklahoma State? Maybe, maybe not, but they're certainly going to be a lot closer. And assuming they bring Paul Rhodes back, they're not starting over with a new coach. And if you start over, you know, how long is that process going to take? It's almost like you get set back to zero if you uh, hire a new guy. Plus, you have, you have a coach in Rose who's that, – that's his destination job. He, he wants to be there. He's invested in the program. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to find that loyalty with, with someone else either. Well, and the administration is not doing Coach Rose any favors. I mean, they need to come out with a vote of confidence now um, as, as we get into the recruiting season so that, you know, the kids know that he's going to be there. And he is the type of guy that if – I mean, I had a kid who was capable of playing college football and he wanted to – uh, stay close to home. I would probably encourage him to play for Coach Rhodes. I mean, I've got to think that he's a great players coach, and kids sure do play hard for him. But let's talk a little bit about you and I. Um, they won their fourth game in a row last weekend. Um, put a forty-one uh, nothing walloping on uh, Missouri State. Um, now their uh, postseason fates in their own hands. If they can take care of Southern Illinois uh, Saturday afternoon in the Uni Dome, uh, they should get an FCS playoff berth. Um, if they don't, uh, I would guess that they're not going to get in. Um, five losses typically doesn't get you into the playoffs. So, um, of course, beating Southern Illinois is never easy. Uh, when you go through the offensive numbers, um, the Salukis are pretty impressive. Yeah, they are. And everything runs through their quarterback market, Iannotti. Um, they ran 809 offensive plays this year, and he's either rushed or passed in 412 of those. So 50% of the plays have basically ran through his. I mean, he, he handles the ball every play, but 412 plays. He's rushed the ball 164 times. He's thrown it 248 times. I mean, this is the guy, and, he, and, he's, and they've been right there. You look at their schedule. Yeah, they're 3-7. and seven. They lost a one, by 1 to Western, 3 to Indiana State. They lost an overtime to Youngstown State. They <coughs> lost a, by 6 to North Dakota State, and then they and 3 to South Dakota. And last week, they led Illinois State at halftime before letting it get away in the second half. So they're a really dangerous team, and additionally, if you look at their coach, Dale Lennon, he's 5-2 and two all time against you and I, including road wins in 2009 and 2013. It has been a tough matchup for you and I. Um, one statistic I noticed, um, they have coughed the ball up 24 times, so um, they, uh, they put it on the ground once in a while and they throw a few interceptions. Um, they don't give up a lot of sacks, though, so I don't know how much. Their offensive line must be pretty good. Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, they, they're going to score some points, Coach Farley said, and... You know, it's uh, how many turnovers can the UNI defense come up with? And I, this is a group, this group, the way they play this last four games, I mean, they had they could not afford any losses starting at South Dakota State. And I think, boy, they are on a mission to finish this job. And, you know, you got uh, you got a group of seniors. They did it last year. They want to do it again this year. And I think, you know, if they get the right, if they can get that passing game going, they're going to be extremely dangerous if they make the play FCS playoffs. Do you get a feel that maybe there's a little chip on their shoulder um, because of those losses to North Dakota State and Illinois State? Yeah, I think so. You know, th these guys, uh, they've been using that as motivation. They, they, it's two games they feel they let get away. It definitely, if it, definitely North Dakota State. They, they, that's when they feel it. they led most of the game. They thought that when they let that one go away, especially that last drive, and they had to go, what it was, 76 yards in about a minute with no timeouts, and they let them go right down the field. So I think I know they feel that one was one they let it go away. Uh, against Illinois State, they just they, the defense didn't play very well in the first half. Illinois State got up on them, and then the offense didn't convert in the red zone at all. Um, so there's two games. Yeah, those two games, they, they've been playing. I mean, the way they the way they approach, the way they talk, every one of them to the person I've talked to after every game, it's, you know, it's just – this week, you know, this week the focus on these guys. Next week's the focus on well, and if we do that, we're gonna make, we're gonna get where we want to go. So far, so good. Um, let's hope they get through this last one and uh, get a chance to play in the postseason and show uh, the type of team they really are to the rest of the country, which, since uh, early in the season, hasn't shown them a lot of respect, at least in the national polls. And based on based on their power in this, right, they're ranked tenth in their in whatever you want to call it, the RPI. Right. You know, they're gonna get a home game. Eight teams get a buy in the FCF playoffs. The other sixteen. They're going to play at home that first game, and then most likely they're, because they'll go regional in that next round, it's going to be either to Illinois State or up to one of the Dakotas. I'm guessing that's my – if they were to win that first round game. But if they win, they're going to be I'm, I'm, they're going to be playing in the Dome the day after – or a couple days after Thanksgiving. All right, Nelly, let's take it one game at a time. I'm looking ahead. <laughs> uh, high school football playoffs, we're down to the championship round Thursday and Friday in the Dome. Uh, we've got two area teams that will be playing for championships, uh, Don Bosco – uh, plays Marcus Meriden Cleghorn on Thursday morning at about nine or so, I think. And, uh, yep, ten, I think. Yep. And then uh, Gladbrook Rhinebeck plays Akron Westfield at uh, one thirty, 
in the afternoon on Thursday. So, uh, Nick, uh, what do you know about these these games and uh, the chances for a couple of state titles coming out of Northeast Iowa again? Well, with the, the Don Bosco game, we'll start with that. It's a rematch from a game uh, three years ago that Marcus Meriden and Clayhorn won. Um, I think they won at 50 some to 51 to 16 or something like that. But, uh, you know, I think only a, a couple players played as freshmen on that. Uh, MMC is kind of an interesting team in the sense that they flipped their quarterback and their uh, top receiver. Um, and so now they've got like a 6'5 tight end who was their quarterback last year. That's been a, a really nice piece to their offense. Uh, the quarterback's kind of a, a dual threat guy that can do a lot with his legs, as you see in eight players. So, so they're, they're going to be a capable team. Uh, Don Bosco, they're coming off their first test of that new Alfonso team. That could have been a championship game right there. Uh, I know Nelly had a chance to watch that, but, you know, they're trailing at halftime. They get a good break, and then all of a sudden they, they roll off uh, 24 unanswered points in the second half. But uh, I think the, the most promising sign from Don Bosco in that semifinal game has to be the way they finished because they haven't had to play four quarters at all this season. Um, so. That, that, that was a, when, when I covered them in the, uh, earlier in the playoffs, that was a thing. They, they had a lot of their starters. They, although they were well ahead in the game, they had a lot of their starters, and they go, many of these guys haven't played in the second half all year long. And they only played seven games. Uh, we note, I think they played a game, and then they had like two bye weeks in a row in the start of the season because they lost some, lost some games off their schedule. They couldn't schedule anybody, so they've only played – they played two less games than everybody. So, but anyway, I, I was it – was it was a great game, and, and I tell you, the onside kick, I mean, he almost missed it. <laughs> And it, it, it perfect. I mean, it just spun off the side, and their guy hit one of the new fun out men, and the, one of their guys recovered it. And I was going, if that was an onside kick, that was a great execution. But like I, I was, I suspected when I got in the post game, he almost whiffed on it. So it was. Uh, but they, they have a great. They're so explosive. They too do something different. They they play two quarterbacks. Brandon Bagby is a more of their passing guy. He will run the ball. And then Nick Mangridge, I, I don't know if I've seen him attempt to pass. I think he has, but he basically comes in and they flank two running backs on the side and he takes a direct snap. The running backs run and he follows them and it's just kind of power football and he's right behind them and he's pretty shifty and he's only about five six five seven. They can't he gets lost in the shuffle. Coach Oder said he's really impressed too with their physicality there in that second yeah. half of that that game and it just seems like you know they're blocking and up front they've, they've been able to kind of overpower a lot of the teams. Yeah, they, they absolutely dominated New Fonda up front and they, mm -hmm. I mean Dalton Smith. Here's a, he's probably a hidden gem here that some pro, college programs need to look at. 6'3", 250, and then none of it's really uh, the baby fat. So, and he just dominated. He was in the backfield all day long. And he could be another eight-man guy that some of the college teams are looking at that could play some defensive line. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Gladbrook Rhinebeck, I think that's going to be an interesting game as well. That's a team that was in the championship game a year ago. Um, their quarterback, Jake Shookman, was a, a backup last year. He got a chance to start after uh, the starter, uh, Camden Kickbush, went down with an injury. So he's, he's been battle-tested, and I think that Gladbrook Rhinebeck team is one that's gotten better as the season's progressed. They uh, had some tough games early in their schedule, lost to Dyke New Hartford, a semifinalist team in 1A, and, and lost to Denver earlier in the season, and then it sounded like the, you know they won a, a great game. Uh, Sully was able to cover there with, with Denver in overtime there in the semifinals. Yeah, it was a terrific game, <clears throat> and uh, that was one of those things where it looked like it was going to be impossible for them to stop Denver. Denver so big and physical on the offensive line, and the running backs are good size. It looked like for a, a moment or two that Denver was just going to keep the ball for four quarters, and, and GR would be able to do nothing about it. <coughs> Excuse me, but they adjusted. They kept blitzing. They finally uh, shut down the running game at least enough to stay in the game, and their offense got going. Um, Colton Dinsdale is one of these kids that's just a winner. Um, finds a way to contribute one way, shape, or form. He ran a kickoff back for a touchdown in the third quarter of, of that semifinal game. They had some opportunities to win late. Uh, their field kicker missed one, then they got another chance to overtime, won that. It's, it's a very, very resourceful team. They're used to being in, in the spotlight. They're, they're used to winning, and I, I think that will help them a lot. I didn't get a chance to see a lot of the Akron-Westfield, I think, Mount Air game, although uh, <clears throat> both teams impressed me as being very physical, uh, very talented, uh, aggressive teams. Uh, it's going to be a tough matchup for Gladbrook Rhinebeck, but uh, again, I just don't know enough about the opposition to say one way or another how it will go, but uh, it should be fun. Well, Rhinebeck's a good story. I mean, I don't think anybody expected them to be playing for another state championship this, this year, but uh, it speaks a lot to that championship pedigree and all the success that they've had and uh, the determination and the drive that those kids just uh, keep finding a way to, to win these games. Yeah, and they're a really balanced team. That's why I noticed I saw them in the quarterfinals. Uh, they, they, uh, they have a good run game, good pass game, and I think their, their secondary on defense has been pretty strong. Um, you just don't see a lot. You don't see a weak spot in their game. I think it, it, they they might not do one thing great, but they do everything pretty well. 
Very good. Um, one last thing. Um, I, I thought we should bring up uh, the Ronda Rousey fight. I mean, it, usually MMA is not uh, in the mainstream sports discussion, but uh, that was a pretty big uh, a fight, pretty big upset. I mean, Holly Holm pretty much cleaned her clock. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, now we're going to be talking about MMA and women's MMA and the uh, uh, inevitable rematch between those two. We've been getting a lot of Ronda Rousey here for the last little while. I mean, maybe over the last year. <clears throat> And uh, the, the things didn't turn out the way most people believed it would. And to me, we have now have our Buster Douglas, Mike Dyson a scenario on, on MMA uh, women's side. And where we go from here, I don't know. If it's anything like boxing, we will see uh, part two of this, of this uh, rivalry, if you want to call it that, sometime down the road. But certainly it's gotten a lot of traction here uh, from ESPN, a lot of the other major uh, uh, sports outlets out there. So we'll see where it goes from here. But certainly it's, it's become something that people are paying attention to. Well, and there's a lot of always discussion about men's and women's athletics being on a level playing field and um, all things being the same. Um, this definitely is the same as men's MMA. I mean, it is vicious. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know if I could name, uh, you know, an M MMA guy on the men's side. So I, I think uh, the women's side actually might even be a little more high profile right now. I was funny. I was reading. I, I, see, I saw it, and I, I don't believe this, but I was reading somewhere. There's some guy that was on the MMA side that said that it was fixed because the, now the next the rematch is going to be that much more money. But I saw that kick. That was not. The, that was not. I don't think I would take that kick just to make more money in the next uh, fight. No. But Ronda Rousey that, that, that would not be signing up for that the, the way that one finished. To no. bring up that story, to bring up the story, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was on Facebook. Somebody posted it was on MMA.com, and he goes that this it was fixed. Because you know this next, the next one, they're both going to make twenty million now on a piece. Where the next one will just make it bigger. The rematch. Yeah, she well, she was dazed. That it looked yeah. to me like uh, Ronda was a little bit dazed after she got hit a couple times. Just, just in the boxing part before the, the kick. Yep. Before the kick. So yeah, I remember, and it's all like the she fights. She never even saw it. that coming. I mean, it just it's, all the fights I've seen her, and she's well, you, you, they're usually over in thirty seconds. You know, she gets in on bar, it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think she'd ever gotten hit like that. So the striking part was what probably caught her off. And then home dodge an arm bar in the, the first round. That's yeah. a big key, key was being able to get out of that. And mm -hmm. It'll be interesting uh, to see where the conversation goes because the sport is so violent. And uh, most of the time, I, I think um, guys do a pretty, or fighters do a pretty good job of protecting themselves against those type of uh, extreme blows. But that one was a dangerous blow. I mean, you, mm -hmm. I could see somebody getting severely injured by a kick like that than when you're you're kind of defenseless. And I think that's going to be where someday, and it's a terrible thing to think about, someday that's going to be a problem for the sport. Right. Someone is going to get killed. It may not happen next week, next month, but I think something is going to happen. It's going to be on TV. It'll be ugly. It'll be terribly tragic. And then this isn't to suggest that it's going to fold the sport right away, but there's going to be a lot of questions asked when and if that does happen. I'm, I'm always amazed when you see a kick like that and you see the person go limp and they fall down that the ref doesn't stop in right away because home got in there and got three yeah. more blows what, before the ref got there. But you saw her, she kind of, when she got hit, she kind of went limp and fell down and the ref like sat there and waited and home got on top and threw three or four more blows. I'm surprised as soon as you see that go like, I know there'd be arguments that well I was I was fine I wasn't knocked out but she was knocked out. And that's the, that's the part that's disturbing for me to watch is after the kick that that she's able to go in and land. And you see it all, you, you know. see it quite frequently when a guy gets hit like that and he gets wrung or he's knocked out and they go in the men's too they still get three or four more blows in before the ref gets in there and it's. Yeah, that was the real deal. You know, yeah. they're not playing with a smaller basketball or you know, shorter golf course or anything like that. I mean, this is yeah. mono e mono or. Whatever you want to define it, uh, it's a. It'll be interesting to see where it goes because that did that border was borderline dangerous, and the way that fight um, shook out, and where it, where it goes in the future. All right, we got to wrap it up. Um, we've been talking long enough this morning. Um, follow all the action at www.wcfcourier.com or in our print editions, and uh, we'll be back next week.